Good evening everyone, it's your man of the hour, the Tower of Power, the living legend of professional wrestling punditry. Hello, my name is Lee Hazel and with me today I have Mr. Positivity himself, Craig Hermit. Hi. Man, a few words there, Mr. Craig Hermit. <laughs> I've also got Tim Birkbeck on the line with us. Hello, <laughs> steel chair writer. How are you doing, Tim? I'm good, thank you very much, Lee. How about yourself? I'm fine, dude. Yeah, I'm really good. Um, uh, yeah, it's been a yeah, it's been a while since we've done this, and in fact, you it's your uh, first time on the steel chair shoot. How are you doing? It is, yeah. It's it's a it's a pleasure to be to be part of this, actually. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, because um, I think you're the first person outside of everybody else that we've actually uh, uh brought in. Um, I think it was only it was only the two Tims that actually showed any uh any interest in in doing this whatsoever. So yeah, that was pretty uh that was pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, how are you doing, uh, Craig? Doing grand, man. It's been it's been it's been a while since we've done this, and it's great to have Tim alongside with us. Basically, uh, for fans who may not know some of Tim, Tim's work, it's been absolutely phenomenal stuff that he's done. I would definitely check some of his stuff out, especially on the mag itself. But it's a pleasure to have him on. It's fantastic. Oh, you're making me blush, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, nice one. Um, uh, uh, in case any of you guys uh, hadn't already guessed, I am actually running a little bit of a cold right now. I've got a little bit of the sniffles. I'm going to try and edit out and make sure none of you guys have to listen or be subjected to any of the awful noises that are currently coming out of my mouth. Obviously, uh, this is the run-up to WrestleMania. We are firmly, we, we are only a few days away uh, from the big event that's coming up in Orlando, Florida. And so what I wanted to ask you two guys was, I was going to go through each and every single match, maybe miss out the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royale because I really like, has anyone even mentioned that so far? I mean, I know it's a thing that exists, but I don't even think that anyone's even um, uh, given that one any hype whatsoever yet. So uh, yeah, we're going to go through the matches except for that one, I think. And uh, we're going to see whether or not you guys are excited about it, what you guys think, whether whether or not you think that WWE could have done better, Craig, I think me and you are going to have a bit of a, an argument. I know there's one that me and you definitely disagree with coming down the line. We have actually got 11 matches to discuss and three opinions to talk about for each of them. And uh, yeah, so we're just going to crack on. Um, uh, so, guys, uh, I will go with Tim first. What do you think about Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson versus Enzo Amore and Big Cass and Shamo and Cesaro? Uh, Shame. Ces Shizaro, Shamaro, <laughs> whatever. Oh. Yeah, you know what they're called. You know who they are. Um, to be fair, I I struggle with this because I really like the club. I think they're being very underutilized within the WWE since they've been given the the tag belts. They haven't kind of really shown that they're the champions, in my view. And the fact that they've now kind of lumped Enzo and Cass into this as well, I just, I don't know. It's just, for me, it feels like the the Raw tag team division have kind of been like, oh, we've got these three tag teams. Let's just use them and we'll wait and see what happens. Like, for me, you've obviously got Gallows and Anderson and Sheamus and Cesaro, who are the four kind of main, main guys for me that can actually pull out a, a good match. Um, I think we're going to end up seeing... Uh, Enzo just being ragdolled around as per usual and then at some point Cass will get the big tag and probably big boot everybody within an inch of their life but yeah in general not massively excited for this I hope that the club retain and it's not a botch finish that they actually win it clean so they kind of look stronger going forward after Mania really. Okay, Craig, our dear editor, um, uh, what do you think? And I know you've got some interesting opinions about Enzo and Cass, so yeah, yeah, go ahead for it, man. What do you think about this I, match? You know what? I really hope this blows the feud off completely. I mean, we've dealt with the club versus Enzo and Cass and she uh, faces Sheamus and Cesaro for, I think it was like since Survivor Series. I, I, sp I was saying, I spoke to this and probably wrote this down somewhere else, but the fact is like, Enzo is like that friend you get who keeps on antagonizing every big guy out there, knowing full well you've got big Cass behind you ready to back him up. And I've got the worst feeling, I have the worst emotional feeling, I've got a feeling like they're going to win the tag belts, even though I would really of the club exactly as tim said the fact is that since they've won the titles they've not been they've basically not been displayed as champions in the sense of where you can look at raw and go these are the champion like cesaro and sheamus these guys can do it they've obviously got the fans and uh, basically the fans love them they are literally legitimate proper tag team credibility that's it and i just really, really have like seen you know Enzo and Cass in the big battle royal and get them out the road. I don't need to see them. I just have the club versus uh, Cesaro and Sheamus and that would be it. And then basically, cool, whoever wins, the both of those two teams would be fantastic. Then lead on to the draft and you know what, even 
I would have even chose rather than having Cass and, and, and uh, Enzo in there and Cesaro and Sheamus, which I still would have loved. Yeah, you know, I would love to have seen the Usos, SmackDown versus Raw, tag teams, just bragging rights. At least, at least that way, have something that would have been meant for this tag team division. Because as Tim said there earlier, it's basically it's just yeah, we've got three teams. We'll throw them into a match, and then that's it. But hopefully. I do cross fingers. Hopefully the club wins it. But I do have the really sh- the sad feeling that Enzo and Kaz will win it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you're not the biggest fan of Enzo and Kaz. And I have to say, I kind of am. I absolutely love Enzo and Kaz. Um, uh, especially I'm Enzo. <laughs> 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 I, I got to say, I actually... And I know like he's a polarizing figure at the moment, especially because he's been uh, quite overexposed. But I actually think Enzo's hilarious. And I think his and Kaz's uh, promos, like, they remind me of, like, the best Attitude Era promos that were, like, loud, they were brash, they could say anything they wanted. You know, I, I like, nobody can script Enzo Amore. Nobody has his voice in WWE. So they have to let him go and do his own thing. And I think that's worked absolutely wonders for him. So I'm actually a big Enzo and Kaz fan. And I tell you this now, they are absolutely winning those tag titles. Because if you ever go onto a uh, WWE's merchandise page, it will show you the featured superstars. And it'll give you all the big names, you know, like Roman Reigns and uh, Undertaker and John Cena. And up there with all of those, uh, like, the big ones that they've really given a huge push to is Enzo and Kaz. And in fact, I actually think they've replaced um, uh, the New Day. So absolutely, I think they're going to win. And I think that's actually going to be a bit of a shame because I think if there's one place, any roster in WWE right now that is overcrowded and needs a bit of breathing room, it's actually uh, the Raw Tag Team title race because uh the club they need to be booked as monster heels they need to be booked as monster dominant heels who can absolutely rip over anybody but with Sheamus and Cesaro as a tag team on that same show that kind of cancels that out because a they both need to be in the title picture because they're both like big huge um uh, you know one's a big huge uh, team from Japan the other guys have been in you know the main events as singles competitors so if they're going to be a tag team together, they have to be in the title picture, because otherwise, what's the point? So having them two in the same place at the same time, I think it's really crowded uh, the division up to the point where I don't think the bookers really know what to do with it effectively. Um, I think the club needs to have those titles for a long time, and they need to be they need to be booked very dominantly while they've been doing it. But similarly, because of how um, WWE views Sheamus and Cesaro, especially how the fans view Sheamus and Cesaro, you kind of need the same thing with them. So WWE are kind of at a bit of an impasse with their roster there but like I said it's Wrestlemania you need the uh, what is it Vince likes to call it um, uh, the feeling of like your high school football team winning the Super Bowl something like that so they need like the big cheer the big face uh, victory uh, for the guys who have never been tag champs before and I think this is going to be their homecoming party it's quite interesting because obviously throughout uh, like their time at NXT everyone thought that Enzo and Cass should have held the belts and obviously never actually did but when they were finally pushed onto the main roster, it's kind of taken them a bit of momentum to kind of get some of the fans behind them, like some of the casual fans. And I think, as as you rightly said, Lee, that their merch sales are probably one of the highest in the kind of whole company. They've even got their own mug now, which speaks volumes, I think. But from someone that watches the products like week in, week out, for me personally, to put the belts on them would kind of devalue it a little bit. Not like not to discredit them as a tag team at all, because as a duo, they work really well. But I, I think that you need to kind of have it on the club a little longer book them maybe after mania as just bulldozing people because since they've come over like from from new japan they had their little run with aj which made them look really strong but since they have stood on their own we haven't really seen them be the team that people who have followed them through years have seen them be and i think that as you as we said it's just kind of the bookers don't really know what to do with any of these teams and it's just like bring the bring in the usos have a have a cross brand match even if it's not necessarily for the titles like you get bragging rights i think it would kind of give a bit more of a feel for which brand's better which belt is more prestigious sort of thing rather than just lumping three teams together yeah i i agree with that actually because one thing that was really um uh, surprised me about this whole uh wrestlemania is we haven't had a single interbrand match i don't think like uh they have that hasn't been any interaction between Raw or SmackDown hardly at all, which mm. I thought was uh, really surprising. But yeah, like um, uh, the problem with the club, how they've been booked in the past, is that they went up against, um, you know, they were the heels going up against face teams, and Raw has two of the biggest merchandise selling face teams in the industry. So obviously WWE want to keep 
them strong. And if they keep them strong, then they're going to have to make their opponents look weak. And unfortunately, the club has been victims of that. Mm. The one thing I would, one mm. thing I would love to see, right? As we're saying, is a. Uh... Enzo and Cass are basically New Day for this WrestleMania because New Day's merch sales destroyed everyone last year. One thing would be great to see. Last, what was it? I can't remember what WrestleMania it was. And um, when, what's his name, won the ladder, ma- won ladder match for the Intercontinental title. Zack Ryder. Even give Enzo and Cass that win this, this bit. Then have either Sheamus or the club win it back next time in Raw. At least I'm giving them that feeling, as you were saying, Lee. Give them that big win. But then after that, either the club or Cesaro or Sheamus goes to SmackDown after in the draft. And that way, the club can be booked utterly fantastically against someone like other teams across there, or Cesaro and Sheamus can be booked utterly better across there. Because we've said, like, I think all three of us can agree that the tag team division is either oversaturated or the booth, or well, let's say the creative division don't really know what to do with it. And the thing is, it'd be great to see this, as I said, as a blow-off to the whole entire, this feud they've had. And then it can just reset. One thing SmackDown's done this brilliantly was it basically capped off their tag team storyline with the Usos winning. And it was almost like a reset. Like, and that, my mind is like, you know when you, used to, when you play WWE games and you get to WrestleMania and basically they have the interbrand matches and then that's your story, like your career storyline done? At the before, just before WrestleMania, it almost yeah. felt like that. Mm. That's what I'm thinking. SmackDown. This is why when you look at SmackDown, SmackDown does a year-long picture storyline where Raw just plays it on the fly. Which, well, in my mind, that's how it looks to me. But this, as we're talking about, no interaction between the brands, it would have been really weird not to. It's, it's just, it says a lot that they're not communicating in that sense where there's total, there's no brand interaction. In my mind, hopefully this blows off the tag team division and then you can look forward to what happens in the draft later on okay cool nice one um uh, yeah the next one is uh neville versus austin aries for the wwe cruiserweight championship uh craig that you know what having aries in the division is just basically piqued everyone's interest in my mind that is aries is as he says he's the greatest man that's ever lived and you know what he actually basically shows it and displays in everything he does like commentating he he's when he was on commentary Anytime he was on it to do the 205 Live, he sold everything, everything brilliantly on it. Basically, he sold the matches, which some people, like some commentators, fail to do. And you know what? Coming in against Neville, both of them right now are the best at the game. But of course, Aries was in TNA. He was the world champion. He was the X Division. He was ROH, sorry, Ring of Honor, and he was a champion there. But right now, having display in front of mil- well, basically going to be millions of people, he will be at the best of his game. I would like to see him new Cruiserweight champion going into this. Neville has done is basically done everything he can with that title so far. Like he's brought attention to it. He's now changed his persona, and you know what? It's it's going to be one of the ones I will watch out for. I would actually just get uh, WrestleMania just for this match, to be blunt and honest. Cool, yeah. uh, Tim. <laughs> I kind of back up what Craig's saying, to be honest. Like I've I've always kind of had a bit of a soft spot for for the cruiserweights, and I think especially since Fastlane, they've put a lot more time of effort an effort into the storylines they're trying to develop within sort of like the 205 brand with kind of obviously Aries finally getting in ring action and against Neville. I think as Craig said, it's kind of piqued the interest of, of some of the more casual fans who know Aries from older work and things like that, who may not necessarily know some of the other cruiserweights. Um, I disagree with Craig putting the belt on Aries because I think there's been too much tossing around of the belt. So I think, Neville needs to retain this and hold it for a little bit longer. But uh, at the same extent, I agree that this could be a potential show stealer. Like we saw at Fastlane with Neville and Jack Gallagher, that was, in my opinion, match of the night. And I think this could, could arguably, again, the Cruiserweights could steal the show. Yeah, I mean, like, they certainly did uh, Neville versus Jack Gallagher. Jack Gallagher, by the way, I am actually really uh, disappointed he's not part of the main show on uh, WrestleMania. I get the feeling that he's going to be part of the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royale. Possibly, Mm. he even might be my tip to win that. I don't know. I think it depends if we're going to see anyone from NXT get involved in it. But, um, uh, yeah, I I would really like to see that. But uh, as for Neville versus Austin Aries, I've, I've got one small problem with this. Neville is the heel and Austin Aries is the face. And that, to me, is backwards. Okay, Neville has never been the uh, the most interesting, like, face persona-wise, but his in-ring style is all pure face. And Austin Aries is just... He's one of the best bad guys in the industry. Like, he's like he's wasted as a face whenever he does that. Like, he has got to be that conniving, dastardly, dirty, like, that sort of Ric Flair kind of guy. That kind of, you know, like, the wheeling, the dealing, the incredibly arrogant 
uh, uh, heel dude. I mean, I think that I think it's going to be fantastic. I definitely don't want to see Neville lose the title, although I think he's going to because I think they've invested too much time into Austin Aries to have him lose his big, uh, his his basically big homecoming match, his big uh, like announcement onto the main roster sort of thing. So I think he's going to win, which I think is a kind of bad for Neville because I think Neville's run has been so good as a heel so far. I mean, I know I would prefer to see him as face, but he has been so good as a heel. I would like to see him continue with the championship. And uh, with, yeah, look, look, uh, like Tim said before, this championship belt has been passed back and forth a bit too much. I still, to this day, have no idea why they gave it to Rich Swan. Uh, Merkel, so uh, right, we've got <laughs> Neville as uh, champion. I think is what uh, the majority of us are saying. But, yeah, two yeah. versus one, mate. <laughs> uh, cool, yeah. So, um, uh, guys, right. Uh, Alexa Bliss versus Becky Lynch versus Natalia versus Mickey James versus Carmella with James Ellsworth, for fuck's sake, and uh, <laughs> uh, versus others, TBA. Now, firstly, who do we reckon uh, the TBA might be, guys? Naomi, surely. Yeah. Yeah. But people are banding about um, uh, uh, Eva Marie quite a bit. I would love that. I would love yeah. to see Eva Marie back. <laughs> No, I would really like it to be Naomi, but I just got this really horrible feeling in my stomach that WWE are going to tease Naomi, then they're going to swerve us, and it's going to be Eva Marie, which is going to be heartbreaking for Naomi. Like, you know, not only, you know, being like, you know, this big hyped up return to a hometown match, like a WrestleMania hometown match, but also then like losing it probably just by inches to Eva Marie. See, I'd quite like to see that. <laughs> The sadistic side of me is basically thinking that would be so good. <laughs> like, is, I'll be blunt honest, I'm in two minds of this one. Like, obviously in my head I'm thinking no one's going to come back, do the win, because that would explain why the title was cut short and stuff, and it would answer all the questions to it, and it would bring a bit more stability to the whole entire um, the title that's happened, because between her losing it within, I think it was like a few weeks, she couldn't defend it within 30 days, so it was passed back to Alexa Bliss, which meant that whole entire bit was almost systematically meaningless, except it did bring fans' eyes to go, and hey, no one could be the champion. And at this point, it would be great to see Naomi become champion. But to have Eva Marie just come out, being the whole entire, you know, after the big, well, what was it, the big type of heel stuff she got, where it's on time she was about to wrestle, something would happen, she couldn't wrestle, she would come out with a flamboyant entrance, something would happen. And yeah, that would be brilliant to see it. But one thing I would love to say is I would just not, I would love to see everyone just beat the hell out of James Ellsworth. Just, you know what, just I don't want to see him anywhere near that card at all. That I is great. Just, <laughs> I would just happily see him at the entranceway, then say, you know, Alexa Bliss or Mickey James, just throw him off something. I don't want to see him on it. I just, it's just, it's, oh, I just. I am nodding my head furiously at that. <laughs> Tim, I, I, for just for like for most people that was listening, and Tim, I just can't stand James Ellsworth. I, I liked him when he first came out, but the joke has just been done to death. Now I liked him in Combat Zone Wrestling, but now right now what's happening, I'm just like, no, nah, I'm sorry, guys. I yeah, can't. they have, they, 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 they have just like they, they have grinded him into dust at this point, and just like taken that dust and sprinkled it over some t-shirts. Like that's basically <laughs> what they've done with him. Uh, cool, Tim. Uh, your take on the match. Um. Again, we've obviously skimmed said about the whole Naomi thing. Like it's kind of written in the stars for her to come back to get the the big win in our hometown. Uh, like Craig, the sadistic side of me would love to see Eva Marie come back, but I think this this whole match is a bit harsh on on Alexa Bliss. To be totally honest, because I'm I'm a massive Bliss fan, and I think that with her match with her match uh, when she lost the belt to Naomi, I thought that was a bit kind of short sighted. I think that the whole kind of multi-person match doesn't really do any favours for someone like Bliss as champion because we forget that how she's still pretty new to the main roster and she's done fantastic work at that. But putting her in a match like this, just I don't think it will showcase her talents at all. I think it's obvious that she is going to drop the belt. To, to who, I'm not too sure yet. Like, part of me would love to see Mickey James win it just to for the nostalgia fact and the fact that I think since she's been back, she's been absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't want to see Becky Lynch with the belt again. I'm like, I'm not a fan. She just grinds on me. So yeah, either Mickey James or uh, Naomi return winning the belt, I think, is what I'd I'd like to see. But I'll agree with Tim on this one. Like Alexa Bliss has done phenomenal stuff since uh, she went on to SmackDown. 
it's been they've done absolutely everything they can with every woman they've had on this one. I mean, everyone's had a chance for this whole entire year to showcase what they've got. I mean, I wouldn't mind having Lynch dra- uh, drafted to Raw and basically even Italia done something with it. But you know what? This reminds me of that thing that AG when AG Lee had to defend her title against what was it namely every person in the division, and that match was just it was not the best I can I can remember. But it's as Tim said, this is not the best way to showcase. Alexa Bliss, I'll be blunt, not probably not the bit unless it's given a sufficient amount of time. But with twelve matches in the card, I doubt they will. It's just it would be nice. It's, it would it would have been nice for like with all the effort SmackDown has done with displaying their women's division, which has been, in my personal opinion, far more superior story wise uh, to the Raw counterpart. It would have been nice for them to have a proper showcase match, either one on one or triple threat style, to show exactly that way. It's not oh, this one's not overbooked or overdeveloped and things. It would have been great to see it. But yeah, with this is what we've got, I'm going to go with definitely, I'm thinking Nomi. Again, Eva Marie would be nice. But, you know, <laughs> but those are the ones. Yeah, um, uh, I personally think that um, it's good that we're getting all of the girls from SmackDown onto the show uh, and actually give them all a match. I would like to see them split up, though. I would like... I, I know it's a busy card. I know there's a lot of divisions we've got to go through. But at the same time, it's like... When it comes to these multi-women's um, uh, wrestlers matches, usually when you add like more, more and more wrestlers into the mix, the more chaotic it gets and a few of the less... Um, uh, uh, less experienced competitors like Carmella, like Alexa Bliss, can get a little bit confused, and you can sort of see them going, "Okay, right, this was this spot. Now we've got to go to the next spot." They don't really know how to connect them very well yet. So, um, uh, yeah, like I, I would prefer them to have like less competitors spread over um, uh, more matches. I understand that the roster is a little bit crowded for them to do that, but that's what I would have liked to see. But uh, yeah, no, with this. I don't know, you know, I think they might be going for a shock win and having Alexa Bliss actually take on all comers and beat them. I actually think that they like Alexa Bliss that much. I think they're going to go for that. And I think, yeah, but like I said, no matter what, I think what's going to happen is is that Naomi's going to get really close and get it taken away from her. As a matter of fact, I actually think that may have been the uh, the plan all along. Like, even when, before she got injured, I think maybe they were planning to have her go into a... Uh, uh, WrestleMania as the champion, but come out of it like having it snatched away from her fingers, just to give yeah. that real sort of like, like wind the crowd up to let them release it later on. Yeah, no, I can, I can see that. Right, the next one, uh, Dean Ambrose versus Baron Corbin for the WWE Intercontinental Championship match. Craig, let's go with you on this. You know what? I actually hope this is going to be a brilliant match. I have my hopes on this one. Basically, between the two of them, the two of them have the making to do it. I mean, I know people right recently have basically gone with Dean Ambrose has tamed himself. He's not he's been as exciting as he was before. But Corbin, since like this last year, has been absolutely just dominant. He's shown a whole lot more character than he's done before. Like watching him talking smack and some of the stuff he's done in the ring has been great. And right now, I would love to see, um, like see the match that Ambrose should have had with Lesnar, where it was just balls coming out anywhere, just and just all sorts of stuff cracking up. It would have been great to see, it was great to see that happen with this, with the way they've been taking it, just going all the way. I would love to see this one just going. I know I don't, I don't know if it's been advertised as a DQ or a balls coming anywhere type match, but you know what? I would love to see it being that and just the two of them just going for it. I would just love to see that just that just showcasing what they've done because they've built it up. The tease is on with wee bits and pieces, but the feud has gone pretty well, and I'd love to see it just going. So I'm going to go with, I'll be blunt, I'll go with Carb, um, Corbin, because you know what? Ambrose doesn't really need the title. His star power is still up there. He hasn't really done, I'll be blunt, hasn't really done the Intercontinental title justice with this term he's had compared to what he'd done before. So giving it to Corbin, he'll take it through. He'll just he'll cap his character off with an extra year of him saying that he's been champion, should have been champion, and you know what? That's what I'm thinking. Uh, cool, Tim. Um... I agree with the whole like because oh, I love Baron Corbin. I think like even when he was still pretty green down in NXT, like just his kind of physical sort of uh, impression that he gave, his whole persona, I just really enjoyed everything he kind of done. And as Craig mentioned, all the stuff he does now on on Talking Smack and thing has just really built his character. Um, I really don't like Dean Ambrose having a belt. Like I think he's better chasing a title than he is holding a title. Like even when he was WWE champion. I think he almost kind of waters down the character that he is. He he needs to be the kind of psychotic person that keeps the champion on edge rather than being the champion that will do anything to win kind of thing, if that makes sense. Um, This is one of the feuds that has been built really well. I think 
they've done well to not actually put these guys in any matches on SmackDown. They've just they've done really well to kind of keep them to little segments, uh, little rush run-ins from Corbin, obviously. Um, and then obviously we saw last week Ambrose kind of finally shown back up, kind of thing. I'd love to see the belt be put on Corbin, but I th- I don't think he's experienced enough yet to have that big WrestleMania moment. He's still because I th- obviously this is his first year on the main roster since, and if we forget he won the Andre Memorial Battle Royal last year, so that was kind of his his WrestleMania moment for that year. So I can't see him him winning it this year. In my heart and heart, I'd love to see him do it, but I, I'm going to go with Ambrose winning. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm, uh, I got to be honest, I don't really like. The more I think about this, the less I care who actually wins, because <laughs> no, well, like the thing is, I really like the feud that these guys are having. But the problem is, is that I don't think the Intercontinental Championship needs to be any part of it whatsoever. I mean, like, when you take Dean Ambrose and Baron Corbin, these are, like, two classically those sorts of guys who have such personas. When you get them into the ring, they don't really need championship belts. They don't really need, like, you know, they've got such strong characters. They do quite well with storylines because their characters have always got, like, some sort of motivation behind them. But the motivation of an Intercontinental Championship it isn't really necessarily needed, and... Uh, what, to what you're saying to him about uh, Baron Corbin only being the first year on the roster, already going after the Intercontinental Championship, it kind of makes me miss stuff like the um uh, uh the European Championship or like the yeah. old Television Championships and things like that. Which is like you've got the big belt, you've got the secondary belt. Maybe the rosters are getting so big and and people are being pushed so far so quickly, it would actually be beneficial for them to bring in like a like yeah. a third belt. So that, like, it doesn't, like, people can have gold, they can have championships, but it don't look like they're being pushed too fast, too strong, too quickly. You know what I mean? Because at the moment, Baron Corbin, guys like Baron Corbin, guys like Braun Strowman, they seem to have, like, shot up into uh, WWE's hierarchy, like, without any kind of, um, like, their personalities being developed, or, or they just kind of seem like... Uh, uh, they've come this way out of absolutely nowhere, you know what I mean? And I think yeah. that is a bit detrimental to their overall characters. I mean, I know that probably doesn't make... That makes a better product than it makes better business sense. But yeah, I just... Yeah, I, I don't think that Baron Corbin's really ready for the championship. And the problem I have with Dean Ambrose having the Intercontinental Championship is that... Doesn't it always seem whenever Dean Ambrose gets his hands on one of these belts, whether it's Intercontinental title or the United States title... That he barely ever defends the thing. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That he, yeah. That he's always in like a feud with like people in the main event scene, and he's like in tag matches with like the the big um uh, the main eventers with the world champions and things like that. Uh, to the point where he's not actually got time in his busy schedule to defend the belt that they've put around his waist. So yeah, like um I I think. I don't really think the Intercontinental Championship is the big thing here. I'm not really sure, like, who... I actually think I'm going to go with Dean Ambrose simply because he lost last year in such, quite frankly, embarrassing fashion. I think they're going to give him the nod this year just to be like, right, okay, sorry about last year. Here, have a win at WrestleMania this year. Hopefully, no one will remember you versus Brock Lesnar uh, at 32. Yeah. No, Mm. like, going back to what you were saying about having a almost kind of like a third belt. I'd, I'd kind of quite like to see that and almost have it as a like an interbrand belt. So you sh- you're showcasing these kind of middle card guys that are being pushed. So like your Braun Strowman's, like your Luke Harper's, like your Baron Corbin's, and it kind of gives them something else to strive for. So that'd be quite interesting if they did something like that. Well, there's always, like, for some reason, I keep hearing, and I've been hearing this talk for, like, the last 18 months of, like, WWE thinking about just dismantling NXT because, you know, NXT's roster, like, as soon as they get in new guys, they spend about five minutes in NXT before they come up to the main roster these days. Mm. So maybe, um, uh, like, because Raw and SmackDown do kind of need, I think, a little bit of a, of a bulkier roster. They need a few more people in there every now and again, I think, just to um, uh, shore up the numbers. And, um, uh, yeah, maybe, like, the NXT belt could be turned into that sort of that third belt if that happens, which, quite frankly, people keep saying it is. Um, I don't think it ever will be. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, right. 
Uh, John Cena and Nikki Bella versus The Miz and Maurice. Uh, Craig. Oh, man. When I first heard about this, I'm pretty sure everyone just groaned when they first heard this. But you know what? The Miz and Marcy is just so damn entertaining. I was, I, I was, really, I was really skeptical about this beforehand. But I think I said this to you, man, about how amazing the Miz is recently. But I say recently, I mean the last year. He's been good before, but he has stepped himself up to the point where if someone said to me, hey, he could be world champion, I actually wouldn't disagree with it. I mean, I know the wrestling style inside is different, but right now his promo skills is all across the board has been fantastic. I mean, he's actually taken many casual fans and fan diehard fans as well who looked at this match and gone, Ugh, really? We would like to have seen John Cena versus The Undertaker. We would like to seen John Cena versus this person. Why have we got to see this happening? But they've actually made it interesting. And that um, total, was that total Bellas thing, Steph Hardy did, I couldn't stop laughing at it. I, I don't know about you guys, but I was got myself laughing. I would love to see the Miz and Marcy actually win it. I would really love to see it, just as a shock. And then, you know, Nikki Bell and John Cena... Whatever they do, they do their thing. They're, they're, they're big enough already. But it's just, I've got another, so that's, before I jump on this one, it's just fact is, you know what? I John Cena, in my mind, and to a lot of fans' minds, has come on leaps and bounds this year, despite the fact that like, I think he was, wasn't was part of the main, well, SmackDown roster for because he was doing movies and stuff. The stuff he's done in the ring, he's like had, he's either put people over, which people were against before, saying that he never does this, but he's had damn good matches with AJ Styles, damn good matches with a lot of people now. And then the promo interactions he's had with The Miz in the run-up to WrestleMania has been phenomenal. Me, I'm actually looking forward to this, where I can say about three months ago when we when we first heard about this was happening, no. I mean, I would love to have seen, you know, Daniel Bryan come back out of retirement. Of course he can't because, he's, you know, WWE won't let him. I would love to have seen that teased with The Miz. That would have been better. But, of course, we've got this. But I would lo- I'm actually rooting for The Miz and Marcy in this one just because they've just it kept me entertained all the time on SmackDown. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I've sat there every single time I've heard them on it. I've gone, right, I'm staying to watch this because I know it's going to be damn entertaining. Cool. Cool. Nice one, uh, Tim. Uh, yeah, kind of the same, like... I think the Miz and Maurice have basically saved this whole feud. Like I think the majority of people when this was being teased and when it was finally announced just went, oh, kind of thing. But the Miz, the way that the Miz and Maurice have kind of told the story, like as good as John Cena is on the mic, I, I think that Maurice and Miz have been the driving force behind this. Um, I'm, I'm still not totally sold on the match like i think this might be like my toilet break match but <laughs> we'll have to wait and see like the whole thing with cena and nikki at the moment kind of mimicking moves uh, and both finishing with the the submission like in the matches they've had so far really really grinds on me I, like for some reason like i don't like that i hope that the miz and maurice get the win but it's mania and i think cena and nikki bella are going to get it um but in in general, yeah, I'm I'm a little bit more interested in this than I would have been, but purely down to how great the Miz and, and Maurice have been in the run up to it. And I think that if this was kind of pitched to to both both couples and they kind of reluctantly said yes, then I think that in the long run we might see the Miz get a rub of it because he has pans down over the last year and a year and a half been WWE one of WWE's top performers and I think kind of a almost as a bargaining chip if if Vince has gone to him be like look we want you to do this mixed tag match at WrestleMania but at SummerSlam we'll give you a title match I'm I'm happy with that uh yeah um the thing with me on this match is the fact that this smacks of um reality tv interference John Cena and Nikki Bella I guarantee are going to win this match and after they have won John Cena is going to get down on one knee and propose to Nikki Bella in one of the biggest reality TV publicity stunts of all time and I think that's the purpose behind this match in its entirety like John Cena was thinking about proposing to Nikki Bella and Nikki thought this would be a good opportunity for Total Bellas and then decided that this should happen uh one of the networks decided this should happen at Wrestlemania um which suited WWE to the ground because they in Instead of having one of the best matches of all time in John Cena versus The Undertaker, they want The Undertaker to put over Roman Reigns. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah, I'm not too pleased with this one, personally. Yeah, also, I think The Miz could have had a much better opponent in maybe Dolph Ziggler. I think that their feuds, like, I know we've seen it done to death 
but honestly, him versus Dolph Ziggler last uh, 12 months have been some of the best matches of Dolph Ziggler's career, and mm-hmm. I would have really liked to have seen uh, uh, Dolph, uh, Dolph go forward uh, and maybe take back like like the Intercontinental Championship, for example, from The Miz. I think that would have been a much better, stronger story and a big reward to both of those guys for making one of the best feuds of 2016. But yeah, no, but like I say, John uh, Cena and Nikki Bella are going to win. They're going to propose... So yeah, that's what I think. Um, uh, oh yeah, Chris Jericho versus Kevin Owens for the uh, WWE United States Championship. Uh, Tim? Uh, I'm going to st- say straight off, the belt does not need to be involved in this match whatsoever. But that being said, this is my match that I'm most looking forward to. Like, I think everything that has surrounded this feud has been absolutely brilliant. I think from, from day one, when we saw Jericho and Owens being put together as the best friends, everybody wanted to see this match, and I'm so glad they're doing it at Mania. Um, Jericho has been hands down one of my favourites for years. Like I, I can even remember having a poster of his up in my bedroom when I was a kid kind of thing. Um, so to see him against Owens, I think this is going to be probably the match of the night I think both guys can put on an absolute clinic when they need to. We've seen that despite his age, Jericho can still absolutely go like a champion. I heard, I read somewhere before that because obviously where last year the swerve with with Jericho and AJ that obviously Jericho got the win. So obviously everyone's expecting Owens to get the win this time round. I think we could see Jericho get the win again. I mean, I know obviously he goes off on his Fozzy tour in May, but you've still got the whole of April for him to drop the belt. So, and I don't, unless they're kind of building to this whole uh, faction with Owens, Triple H, Samoa Joe, then I don't see why Owens needs the universe, uh, sorry, the United States Championship. Like he's, he's in the main event picture. He doesn't need that belt. Yeah. So, I, and I, I, it'd be the perfect kind of revenge tale that Jericho does get the win. Um, it'd be nice to kind of almost see him kind of do a pop-up power bomb. So it's a right, it's a complete insult that he wins off Owen's own move. But yeah, I, I'm going with a with a Jericho win on this one. Oh well, I oh, well. honestly did not uh, see that one coming. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, Craig, uh, what do you think? We know I'm going to think it's going to be an Owen's win. We know this, right? But. How is it happening? My mind is agree with Tim all the way on so much of that. Is everyone was has been waiting for this to come. It's been so well done. And when we heard, like, I don't know about you guys, but I heard rumors it was supposed to blow up at uh, Fastlane, and people on Twitter at the same time just went, "Oh, please just leave it for Mania." And then we got the wish. It's going to be Mania. Super. And you know what? I do think it's going to be Owens that gets the win, but I think it's going to be interference either caused by uh, Joe or Triple H, or Sami Zayn accidentally doing something. And the end picture would be, in my mind, Kevin Owens standing tall alongside Samoa Joe and Triple H just looking down at Chris Jericho in the mind going, I didn't need your friendship to start with. I've got this faction here, and now I've got the title. And I've taken something from you. And it'd be so good just to see that. It would be. I mean, the thing is, as Tim said, the two of these two guys don't even don't need the title. They don't really need it. But you know what? It fits the storyline because uh, Jericho cost Owens the championship. It'd be nice. It'd be basically working out a poetic justice if uh, Owens takes Jericho's title. And it'd be working out brilliantly. There's so much of this. It's just, it's the best developed storyline in Raw because they've done it. They've actually put effort, time, and they've had the right people to do it. It's just so good. And you know what? This could, this also could be one of the matches of the night. This is exactly as fact as this is the one I'm tuning in for because it's just going to be so good. I can't say any more about it. I can't hype up enough. I don't need to hype it up because it's just telling itself. I mean, I remember watching Chris Jericho at Vengeance 2001, uh, basically where I managed to trade a VHS uh, video to see him win the Undisputed Championship. That's what I had to do back then. And you know what? I remember watching Kevin Owens because I traded videos to get the ring to watch him do the Ring of Honor stuff when he's part of the Scum Fact. It's so good to see them doing it on WrestleMania against each other. It'll be so. This is just. This is the one. You know, this is the one I'm looking forward to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I, I think everyone's looking forward to this one. I think this is the most hyped, one of the most hyped matches. Certainly the longest story, the longest and the strongest story. I think. Um, personally for me, yeah, like. 
There are a couple of matches uh, with Raw uh, superstars on them. We'll get to one in a minute that do not need belts at all. Like the story is strong enough for like the belt not to matter at all. Because if the belt isn't the main focus, which this most certainly isn't, then do we really need it in there? And like, you know, later on. But I think if we're going to do this then it should have been for the Universal Championship. If you're going to do Chris Jericho versus Kevin Owens, then I think the United States Championship is just a little too mid-card for the pair of them. In fact, I actually kind of think, and this is a real shame for the belt, that it kind of diminishes how important this match feels. But yeah, I, I get the feeling that Kevin Owens... Um, I think that this... I think this is going to be where um, Samoa Joe uh, makes his appearance rather than... In the Seth Rollins Triple H match, I think uh, Triple H is going Triple H match coming up. I think Triple H match is going to lose. I think he is going to um, lose against Seth Rollins, and I don't think that he's going to want to lose against Seth Rollins while he had help. He's going to want to stay stronger than that. So I think this is where we see uh, uh, Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe's going to get into the ring. He's going to cost Chris Jericho. And we're going to have Kevin Owens as champion uh, with a probably brutal fashion. I think after this, we're not going to see Chris Jericho for a while. I think Chris Jericho is going to get the crap kicked out of him. Like in a major way that is going to cement the uh, relationship between Joe, between uh, Owens and all of uh, uh, Triple H's other factions. Uh, you think in Power Trip style? The Power Trip style that happened with Austin and Triple H? Yeah, pretty Owens much. The rock type thing. Cool. Yeah, and yeah, also I think like at some point wasn't um, uh, the club supposed to be connected with them as well? Like I think they hinted at that, but then I think they've like gone in a different direction. They've kind of dropped that. Oh well, anyway, um, uh, uh, right guys, so uh, Bailey versus Charlotte Flair versus Sasha Books versus Nia Jax, and I'm actually going to take the lead on this one. I think that what they have done with the women's division on Raw is an absolute tragedy because they had two really strong matches that they could have gone with here, Sasha Banks versus Nia Jax and Bayley versus Charlotte Flair, that had these really strong, good booked storylines going into WrestleMania. And at the last minute, they've decided, oh, we don't have the room for them on the card. We need to squash them together. So Bayley versus Charlotte Flair should have been Bayley going in as the challenger, looking to finally beat Charlotte Flair's pay-per-view record, which Charlotte Flair should have kept going into Mania. And then she should have, like, been like, oh, I am the pay-per-view queen, and now I'm going to go into the biggest, the brightest, the grandest pay-per-view of them all, and I am going to be the queen of the pay-per-view at WrestleMania. And that's where Charlotte Flair takes her out. And obviously, we've got the whole Nia Jax working on Sasha Banks, squashing her, injuring her, and Sasha Banks getting her own back against Nia Jax, but no. Because we have to make room for the part-timers for the special attractions for all of the other guys on the roster we have we can't have those two incredibly strong storylines going on we have to uh, take them squash them together and make something that is a lot more insipid um, a lot more diluted and frankly nowhere near as good as what the matches could have been if they had them separately craig um well you said a lot in that one, which is all true, to be blunt. Though. It's a good chunk of that was absolutely right. I mean, there's one meme that I saw that basically Bailey versus Charlotte versus Shasta Banks, Sasha Banks, sorry, and basically it had that keyboard button where it said in, up, uh, upgrade, and then it showed Nia Jax. And it went, no, 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 downgrade, downgrade, downgrade. And that was it. And the thing is, it's basically nothing against Nia Jax in this one. She deserves, her and Sasha Banks deserve their place on WrestleMania. If it was another time of year, not a problem. But as to, as you said, Lee, the fact is they've got two good storyline matches, but the but WWE has, and I would just say, bollocks it up on so many levels. They have basically, this is like Nia Jax is basically coming and destroyed, practically has destroyed Bailey and Sasha Banks. Now, one thing that vexed me was, it was a no disqualification match I think Nia Jax had with Bailey. Now, is that not the best way to say that, you know what, Nia Jack and Nia Jack's coming out going, Bailey, you actually beat me, even though she didn't, but you come around and go, Bailey, you beat me because you had to do anything you could to, to stop basically no disqualification should we can. But Nia Jax won that one in convincing fashion again. Beat uh, Sasha Banks. Oh, sorry, Sasha Banks beat her, but it was by fluke or something like that. And it's just, oh, there's just so much which is wrong with all of this. It's like, as you said, it should have happened like Fastlane. It all began with Fastlane where basically, you know what, um, Charlotte should have kept the streak. She could have even won by disqualification. Sasha Banks came out and hit her, I think it was. And then, that, is that not a disqualification? Of course it's a disqualification. And Bailey would have still turned around and went, 
oh, how could you have done this to me, Sasha Banks? How could you have done this? And that would have sown the seeds for a Sasha Banks Bailey feud going after WrestleMania, long term picture type effort. And then that would have happened. It would have been brilliant if we did it that way. Then Charlotte Flair coming up going, I come in, as you say, come into WrestleMania. I am the queen of pay per view. Where it all began, where I got my first reign. Yes, I am the champ. I am the queen. There you go. It would have worked out brilliantly that way. But you know, time constraints or other things, or just other things, or it would have been better in my mind. It's going. I, I would actually see. I would actually like to see Sasha Banks do uh, win the title, just because in my mind she would do something like betray Bailey. Or just basically swerve on Bailey to start the feud that should have been happening for a while because they've been so pally pally. They've been pally for a while, but the WWE's been pushing it down our throats for a while now, which I would love to see just after WrestleMania. Like, the thing is, after this, I would love to see that feud go, and I would love to see either Charlotte or someone being dra- or Nia Jax being drafted across to SmackDown and then get someone new in. I mean, when you look at NXT, who, who could probably get, get an Oscar, and uh, Oscar back up. That would be great to see her in there. We've got some great people on um, NXT. You've got who they called Sarah Brilliant, uh, Sarah Bridges, who was, of course, Mary Dobson. It'd be brilliant to see her even just doing some because they've had the training, they've had the work. They could just go cement easier to slide into it. Ruby Riot, who's just suddenly back uh, into NXT. But you know what? We've had worse call ups. We've had Dana Brooke. Come on. But you know what I mean? It'd be great to see just something fresh with the women's division. If this is the way, you know, this match is, again, another blow off on this feud of all the feuds, have it done and dusted, start afresh for a long term storyline going after this leading after the draft. My mind, Sasha Banks are betraying Bailey just to sow the seeds for the future for the feud probably going into backlash or the draft. There you go. That is better booking than WWE is capable of doing, Craig. Come on, you know that. <laughs> don't, okay. don't, don't ruin my dreams, man. I, I, I have hopes that they will do the right thing, okay? <laughs> dude, 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 right, okay. That makes sense. That makes narrative sense. It makes character sense. You know they're never going to do that. Um, cool, uh, Tim. Uh, I kind of agree and disagree in parts. I was just, I think all the women kind of deserve like a, a spot, but I agree that it is kind of that feel of two storylines being pushed together. I think Charlotte could have should have gone into this match as champion um, and had all four women in it, and then have someone maybe Bailey win it in that area, but have her pin Sasha Banks because then Charlotte keeps her her undefeated pay per view streak. Bailey goes over as the as the massive baby face and it sparks the feud between Bailey and Banks. So that's how I would have booked it. Um, but the way it is at the moment, I think we're gonna see, like Craig said, I think we're gonna see a swerve with with Banks probably winning over over Bailey, but in a in a conniving kind of way. I think even what I wouldn't like to see it, but I think that the way it could be done and, and done well is if you have Jax just bulldozing through everyone um, and then almost offering Bailey up on a plate to to Banks and then kind of having Banks and Jax kind of paired together as kind of Jax's Sasha's muscle um, and nobody can touch her as the champion. But I think again, I think kind of what you said, Lee, is kind of WWE booking logic won't prevail that way. So it's an interesting one. Like I can't actually see who's going to win this and who's going to come out looking good, but that is the glory of WrestleMania, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this one goes because um, uh, you guys are taking this in a sort of direction that I uh, that I hadn't really thought about myself. So, yeah, no, it'd be interesting to see if they do that. I still... Bailey's going to win it, I think. I think they're going to give her a WrestleMania moment. I think they're going to give all of the little girls around the world who are, like, the prime... Because you know, they say the two biggest merchandise uh, buying people uh, demographic on Earth are gay men and little girls. So yeah. they are going to give... Uh, they, they are going to give them... Or maybe they don't need uh, uh, Bailey to win in order to, to buy her merchandise. Maybe they'll buy it regardless. I, I don't know. But, um, uh, yeah. Um, anyway, moving on to what... I don't know. Especially between me and uh, Craig, I think maybe the most divisive match of the night. Um, uh, Shane McMahon versus AJ Styles. Craig, what do you reckon? Oh, why? Why would you, why would you get me to go this first, man? Come yeah. on. This is the problem. I can see several ways where, you know, I can find this match really interesting and stuff, and I can find it... Ugh, right, okay, let's just be blunt. I'll go, I'll start with it now. Uh, this match does not need to happen, right? This match is... There's no real... Int- like, I can see what, how they built it up, and logically, it's so good. 
right? Logically, how they built it up, it makes sense for the inevitable with their AJ, which AJ Styles better win, but AJ Styles winning going to Raw. It would make sense because you know what? No matter what happens, if AJ Styles beats Shane McMahon, he could turn around and go, look, I can't stay in the same roster with a guy who just kicked, you know, kicked his arse. I'm going to Raw. They'll treat me better. Or if Shane McMahon beats AJ Styles, but I can't work with someone who's basically over, basically dominates a whole entire, you know, Smack, SmackDown division, who comes in telling us it's all about the young guys, it's all about, it's no longer about, you know, authority figures, it's no longer about the McMahons, it's all about the young talent, it's all about the new talent, and basically lords over us, and then he'll go to Raw. Um, this, everyone would have loved to have seen Taker versus Styles, or Shawn, Michael, Shawn Michaels versus AJ Styles, but you know what, um, I've got much respect for Shawn Michaels, who's still doing, who's still doing a lot more with the home tire factor, going, look, I'm going to stay retired and, and, and honouring that, because you know what, it means a whole lot more to what he's done, rather than him coming back out for one more match, but as this is a match that just didn't have to happen, I mean, when AJ Styles cut the promo, I think it was last week, going, I'm doing this match because I want my WrestleMania, it was the only way to get onto the card, it was the only way to get my WrestleMania moment, you know what, a lot of people agree with it, going, you know what, I guess the home time for him to be on WrestleMania, he had to go with Shane McMahon, and it just, there's parts of it where it's, as I said, it's done really well, I mean, if it was anyone else other than AJ Styles, you could, you could get into it, or you would find an idea about it, because it has been done, done slow, it's done, done brilliantly, because Ever since he started complaining about why should I have to actually fight another opportunity, why should I have to get another opportunity to fight for to become number one contender to be the title for the championship, and it makes sense when you look at AJ Styles' uh, booking for it. You can see his reason. It's another one of these storylines where he turns around and goes, "Why are we cheering, cheering for Shane McMahon when AJ Styles does have a case here?" And you know what? It's it's a match that you know what. It's, I'll watch it for AJ Styles, you know, doing everything he does because he doesn't do a bad match. I mean, I don't think, I'll be blunt and honest, even his worst times in TNA, it was, what, three star matches at least. Shane McMahon, he'll do his, you know, jive thing, he'll do his rap, his punches, and then he'll do some flying thing off a, t- off a turnbuckle onto a table or some, like, some type of thing. I don't know what it is. It's, based, it's just, I used to be a magic amazing fan of Shane McMahon, but this match just does not interest me at all. I would watch it just for AJ Styles to get his moment and hopefully kick Shane McMahon's ass, and then that's it. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, okay, then. Um, uh, wow. I actually <laughs> thought you would be a lot higher on that match than I was going to be. Um, uh, okay, oh. Tim, I'm going to uh, let you go off first because I've actually got a rant about this match and I've run out of water, so I need to go grab some more. So you guys continue. And I just, yeah, I, I need to grab some more to prepare myself for, for the epicness that goes ahead. Really? <laughs> yeah, I have opinions. Okay, I'll see you guys in a second. <laughs> Well, I kind of think that Craig's was always quite a rant as it is, and I don't think there's a whole lot that I can kind of add to it. Like like any sort of logical wrestling fan, you look at this match on paper and just think, why have you got one of the, the best wrestlers in the world against Shane McMahon? It just, do- it just doesn't make any sense. And like Craig said, yeah, the build for it has been absolutely fantastic. Like the attack in the car park. The, I wasn't a massive fan of, of, of the spot on last week's Smackdown with with Shane dropping the elbow through the table, yeah, okay. but it adds to the storyline. It and as as you said, Craig, again, it's the whole. Well, if I, if this is the match I need to have my WrestleMania moment, then so be it. But there's just there's just so many other people on that roster that AJ could have had a a better, a more meaningful match. Like, okay, maybe we don't want to see AJ Cena again. Like we've seen that, and they've. They've kind of done their bit. I, I, I agree with the whole Shawn Michaels thing. Would have loved to have seen it, but like massive respect for him for saying I'm retired and I'm sticking that way. I wouldn't have really gone with with AJ Taker to be honest, because we'll, we'll get on to Taker in a minute. But personally, I would have loved to have seen AJ against Brock Lesnar. I think that would have been a an incredible match just because they're complete opposites of styles. Um, they've obviously both had kind of history in Japan, so they can both work stiff matches um and it would have been nice to actually see brock go against them i know obviously we've seen him against people like uh like ambrose and cena and things like that in the past but for someone of, of aj styles as standard for him to maybe go over someone like brock lesnar would have really cemented him in wwe because go, going back to the whole baron corbin thing 
AJ's actually only been in WWE a year. But okay, everyone knows the work that he's done in the past and what a great athlete he is. But in terms of WWE, he's been skyrocketed so quick. Um, and apart from Cena, he hasn't really kind of feuded with any of like the names, quote unquote. So I think he needs to get a couple of those those big name wins under his belt just to kind of cement himself as a WWE guy rather than just an incredible wrestling talent. Um, in terms of this match and the result, I think we're going to see uh, a ridiculous Shane spot, whether that's kind of off the stage, off the ramp, off the turnbuckle. Like, we know it's going to happen at some point. It'd be interesting to see if, if AJ goes for a Styles clash in this match, because obviously you've got to be educated on how to take that move. Um, so I, I don't think Shane's like got no. enough in <laughs> And know how to take that move properly. I I was um, going to say in my in my bit um, uh, that I thought that possibly like what would happen if if AJ Styles broke Shane McMahon's neck like because I genuinely think that's a huge possibility. Yeah, yeah, it is definitely hands down a possibility. So we could almost see a watered down version of AJ in this, which would be a massive shame. Um, I think if AJ doesn't walk away with a win, then there's something terribly wrong. But yeah, I, I'm going. I'm going with AJ to win, and hopefully later down the line we see him get the belt for a lot longer again. You know what? I'm going to jump in and say, you know what? That was a great point for the Brock Lesnar thing. I was actually just, I did not think about that at all. You know what? I would love to have seen that. That was a much <laughs> better match than I could have. That, you know what? That to have two of New Japan's former champions. You know what? That that if you, if you were here right now, I'd have fist bumped you right now for that one. That was a top match. That was. That is what I'm, I just saw it and I thought, you know what, that's a that's an awesome point right there. Top notch, man. <laughs> I hate to rain on your guys' parades, but if Don't that were that to, guy. if that were to happen, Brock Lesnar would steamroll AJ Styles, and AJ Styles wouldn't get like an iota of offense in like. I don't th- like he'd probably get in less offense than John Cena got at SummerSlam against Brock Lesnar. I I think like you know the way that they like to book the way they like they like their monsters, especially the way they like their big muscular monsters against the smaller guy like Styles. He would absolutely destroy uh, AJ Styles. I think yeah, like like that that right, match. Right now, I can, right, I'm going to say right now, Lee. I, I people that are listening to this, I can literally hear the keyboards running off, going on about the differences between New Japan and WWE booking right now. <laughs> I would literally just hear people just going, "Oh, this is the difference between their booking." Sorry, carry on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing. Like, and and secondly, and I hate to rain on you guys' parade twice. I think anyone who thinks AJ Styles is winning this match is crazy. I genuinely think that. I think that Vince, there's no way Vince is going to book his son to lose twice. I think Shane will want to lose. I think Shane will want to put over AJ. But I think Vince will put his foot down and say, no, especially you are the face. You are the um, uh, you, you are the guy in charge of uh, SmackDown. And as well, AJ Styles, let's not forget, started off this feud like the physical part of this feud by engaging in criminal behavior which he has currently been rewarded for i think he's got to um, uh, keep his uh, his sponsors happy and say right okay this guy who put a man's head through the window of a car needs to face consequences and those consequences have to be a humiliating defeat at the hands of a non-wrestler i i genuinely think that i get the feeling that vince is going to book this so that the quote-unquote face is going to win, so that the heel is going to lose, so that the crowd can cheer and chant and go home happy, like Vince likes people to go home happy. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so I think that's going to happen. And secondly, they could have done... Like, like, anyone else on the roster, and I would have been happier than him going up against Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon is not a wrestler. I think that was hugely exposed last year against him and The Undertaker. He tried to do some genuine wrestling moves. He tried to do a sharpshooter, for example. And it looked like garbage. It looked terrible. And, like, this guy... Like, this guy can fling himself off of things that are very high into things that are very hard. And that is the absolute limit of this guy's wrestling skill. AJ Styles can have a good match with anybody. As long as that other person is a wrestler. Shane McMahon isn't. And, like, you know, especially with a moveset like Shane McMahon has, like... What Tim was saying earlier, you need a lot of cooperation 
when you face a guy like AJ Styles. You need a guy who can, who knows the moves, who is experienced enough in the industry to know what he's doing, when to tuck his head in, when to stretch it back, you know, when to do this, when to do that. I don't think Shane McMahon's got any of that stuff. We will see a watered down version of AJ Styles. This will be a massive hardcore spot fest that will see barely any real wrestling in it whatsoever, which is just the absolute opposite of what I want from AJ Styles. I think his TNA days of doing heavy spot fest matches are behind him. I think he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. I think this is absolutely the wrong way to use him. And it is an example of, and, and look at the other matches on this card. Shane McMahon versus AJ Styles. Undertaker versus Roman Reigns. Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton. Chris Jericho versus Kevin Owens, Triple H versus Seth Rollins. It's all one of the new guys, one of the big hot talents, versus someone from the Attitude or Ruthless Aggression eras. It's like they don't have the confidence in any of the new guys to be able to hold up major marquee matches by themselves. Mm. And that is a problem that I think WWE has massively got right now, in that they do the whole thing of, oh, well... The guy from years ago is a bigger draw than the new guy we've got coming up, so we'll book them two in a match. And so, but the new guy, if they get booked to lose, they can never look strong enough to become a big draw, so that they can become a legend themselves. And I think that's a big problem that WWE, they've got this vicious cycle of new guy goes against old guy, old guy wins, new guy can't get booked strong enough so that he can ever be as big a draw as old guy was, and over and over and over it goes. So yeah, like, I, I think that's going to happen. Um, yeah, like, this, this match, as soon as I heard it, just made my heart sink and make me think, oh, okay, yeah, this is this is the bad sort of booking of WrestleMania. This is the showy, nostalgia-y, uh, like, casual fan booking. Um, you do know they've got Goldberg versus Rock Brock Lesnar, right? <laughs> oh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that one. We'll get to that. We'll yeah. get into that one, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so, yeah, like, I, I've said all I wanted to say about this. This is a very disappointing match for me. I really wish they used AJ Styles better. I think they could do a lot better than this. Um, I'm actually going to... Wikipedia have not listed uh, one of the marquee matches of the event, and I've already mentioned it, but um, uh, I'm, I'm going to insert it here. Seth Rollins versus Triple H. How do we reckon that's going to go? Tim? Um, well, kind of going back to what we, we said earlier about where, where Joe's position is going to be and like how, I can't remember who it was that said, but Triple H not losing this match uh, to kind of build that kind of faction that's being proposed. Like I kind of see that this would be a, a place where Triple H just does just destroy Rollins. Like we, obviously we saw him come out two weeks ago with the whole Kingslayer t-shirt and things like that. And I think that mean like that means all fingers point to to Rollins winning. But I can see I can see it happening. I could this is the way I see it. I see that Rollins would pick up the win, but then Triple H just absolutely kills him after afterwards and that's where we see uh joe come down and get involved so i don't know how they're gonna do it because obviously where is kind of a, a quote-unquote unsanctioned match like is it just going to be like a straight up brawl is it going to be refereed is it going to be no disqualification that those kind of things haven't been clarified yet um and obviously there's going to be a massive play on on what seth's injury is um i'm not in terms of kind of excitement like when this was initially kind of being built like months ago it was one of the matches i was quite looking forward to um but the more and more we get closer to it i, I couldn't care less to be totally honest um i think as i said i think rollins goes over um but with a massive beat down afterwards because then it kind of puts seth off screen for a little while to to actually fully recover from from his injury it will bring around this faction of joe owens and triple h and then later on down the line, when Seth is is fully healed, he can come back and be the the baby face against the the faction that's running roughshod across the whole roster kind of thing. So that's that's the payoff that I'd like to see. Um, but yeah, in general, really not excited about this match at all. Uh, wow. Um, uh, Craig. Yeah, you know what? There's a lot of what Tim's saying is quite right. I mean, it's the was like exactly as the same. The hype for this was immense long story it has the whole entire idea for it i don't know what's happened with it but long-term planning brilliantly done and you know what as we're slowly getting closer i don't know what's happened i mean over our social media myself included as the clock is ticking down whether it's like you know absence 
has made fans lose interest in it is literally people are saying the same thing it's not had as much hype as before it's not had as much interest as before it's just there's something about it that's i don't know there's just like it's, it's had the right people i mean triple i think it's mainly the fact is that everyone now relate to triple h as being the head of nxt is basically not being the main character person as he was before where if he was more healy he was more bad guy it was more something we'd have more interest in it. I don't know what's happened. I can't put my finger on it. I'm not going to. But what I will say is this, is that, you know what, I can I agree with Tim on a lot of stuff, but I think we're going to see something along the lines of the SummerSlam 1992 F, sorry, SummerSlam 2002 effort with Shawn Michaels on the chance of match with Triple H, where I'm thinking Rollins will get the win, because as they said, it's probably going to get a win via a roll-up, and then the beatdown's going to happen. It's probably, Joe will probably try to attempt to interfere in the match at some point, uh, Rollins will fight him off, violently fight him off. Maybe Zayn will jump in again. But then at that point in time, get the victory roll up, and then it'll be a mass domination from Joe and then be with Triple H. And then we'll probably see uh, Owens in a feud as well. And just the three of them. I've just got this image of the three of them standing tall and neither the Jericho match or this one, just making their presence felt. And you know what? Long-term planning, which would be really great, was for Stem running back and then... Rollins coming back after his injury, giving time proper time to heal him and then facing off. It'd be great to see it, but exactly as Tim said, there's been is is he's not alone in this where the fans like it's not as much interest in it as before. I mean, I don't know what's happened. Maybe you maybe uh, Lee you put a finger on it, but I really can't see what's going on. It's just whether it's, you know, the over the overhypeness of Goldberg and Lesnar or maybe it's the Reigns and Undertaker thing, but right now it's like it's go but many fans going into this WrestleMania is not as hyped for it as it probably should have been when it first uh when we first got teased about it. Uh yeah, I mean yeah, I, I agree with a lot of that actually. You guys have made me realise how down on this match when I should be massively hyped for this match. <laughs> like, you you guys have actually yeah, made me realise that oh god, yeah, no, like this is this might not actually be that good. I mean <laughs> and, and secondly, um firstly, my big problem with this match is is effectively Triple H, even before all of that other stuff you guys have said. Triple H has had far too many boring, slow-paced WrestleMania matches. Um, his match against Batista, when Batista won it off of him the first time, was slow-paced and really boring. His match last year against um, uh, Roman Reigns is one of the worst main events, I think, in WrestleMania history, just for sheer, utter tone deafness of, oh yeah, no, here is your hero. We don't want this hero. Oh, here, have one of the most staggeringly dull-paced, thuddingly dull matches you have ever seen in your life. And this is how we coronate at WrestleMania, the guy we're going to be pushing for the next 20 years. You know, no thank you. I I even even uh, Undertaker's... Um, uh, Triple H's match with The Undertaker a few years ago like started off like really ploddingly and like just them two chucking into one another uh, chucking each other into things which is a lot of what I'm a uh... Triple H's offences these days, it's what I call bums rush wrestling. Uh, <laughs> Bret Hart called it easy wrestling. Basically, grab the guy by the seat of the pants, grab him by the back of the collar, and chuck him into a barricade, chuck him into steel steps, chuck him into the announce table or the timekeepers area. We're going to see a lot of that. We are going to see a lot of them just like picking each other up and throwing each other into things. And I, I really hope it's better than that. I hope it's more technical. I hope it's more... Um, I, I hope we see a lot of submission moves. Him trying to get Seth Rollins to tap out. Seth Rollins cannot tap out. Seth Rollins has to win. He has to persevere over this. Because S Triple H has made so much about Seth Rollins being a loser. Being a guy who needed to have his hand held throughout his entire reign as champion. Which, to be fair... The way he was booked, he absolutely did. He was booked to be a weak, cowardly heel. And now they want him to be a face, the guy actually has to start winning. The guy has to start... Well, like, like, even if he does get beaten down afterwards, he has to persevere. He has to have his hand raised in victory. Even if he, even if he leaves the arena in a stretcher, that has to happen. But yeah, um, the whole unsanctioned match thing... Like, people are still, like, genuinely thinking that this might not even happen. Like, I mean, it it may turn out that his knee is truly fucked and cannot be repaired in time, which means that they might just have a, an extra 10, 20 minutes to add to 
any other match they want. Um, yeah, okay, so that's over. Oh, God, what, what do we think of this? Undertaker versus Roman Reigns. Uh, Craig will go with. You know what? Going with this match, I don't mind it. I mean that in the sense of where, like, well, I'm not hyped about it. I'm not really too... I'll be honest, out of the matches on the card, I'm not really too bothered about it at all. I mean, like, it's The Undertaker. We know what to expect. We, I mean, like, I've like, literally been a fan of his for a while. But you know what? It's like, it's only to a point with the thing with The Undertaker before was the streak, right? And we can go on and answer where who should have won the streak, who should have won the streak, blah, blah. But fans before <laughs> Brock Lesnar ended the streak said it should have gone to someone new. It should have gone to someone who's the up-and-comer, who's going to be the new face. And people did say Roman Reigns, and now we're getting that match. And you know what? It's I think there's a all because everyone has a mixture of emotions. The John Cena effect with Roman Reigns, where you know what he's that guy has been pushed no matter what happens. And you know what? Whether you like or we like it or don't like it, he sells a lot. And P and the fan WWE of course love him. But the thing is, when you look at social media and stuff, he has his as I said the John Cena effect. He has lots and lots of fans as well. Same with the Undertaker, but you know what? The Undertaker does need to retire at some point. It's the the day, whether it's this year or next year. If it's this year, he is. Even if he loses to Roman Reigns, you know what? In my mind, it's the right thing to do. It's the right call. Uh, Roman Reigns, you know, whether he's the guy, he is the man or the guy, whatever you want to call him. He is basically the guy that should defeat the Undertaker. It's, it should have happened a while ago. It should have happened before now we're getting it of course it would have gone to the rub that matters it would have gone that rub of the win should have gone to something um but you know what i'll be blunt last i can't really get i would love to go on a full-on rant but i don't even have the energy to go into because you know what it's just it's roman reigns doing his thing i mean like see if braun Strowman was in this one like even if they made a triple threat i mean it would have been a whole lot easier but you know if it, was, if it was Undertaker versus someone else or Braun Strowman versus Roman Reigns for Re at WrestleMania, I would have been quite happy with Roman, um, Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns. I'd be quite happy with that one because, you know what, the match they did at Fastlane, I did not mind. It was good. Um, but, you know what, I can't get myself hyped up for this one. I mean, I should. I, I know I should. This is Undertaker match. But, you know, it's... I, I can't, guys. Sorry, I can't get hyped into this one. It's just... I've got a feeling Roman Reigns will win. It's going to be another one of Roman Reigns winning. Undertaker either... You know what? One thing I would love to see. One thing I did have that. One thing I did hear about was I would love to have the Undertaker actually winning the title. Uh, I think it was like before, like if it was like booked where Undertaker winning the title on the run up to WrestleMania, uh, facing Roman Reigns, Roman Reigns winning, and Undertaker retires, leaving the belt, or even Roman Reigns winning and Undertaker winning the belt here, then retiring, leaving his hat and the title as a last figure, as a last shadow type thing in the match, and then going and this being his last match. I would love to have seen it being a title match or something along those lines, if we were in a parallel world, that is. And just for me to get hyped up about it, because I can't, for the life of me, get hyped up about this at all. Sorry, guys. Can't do it. <laughs> I, I kind of agree to an extent. Like, I, I agree that I'm not that hyped about the match. But I think what we've said is, with obviously with Reigns, I think most people think that Reigns is going to go over, and in my opinion, not rightly so. I think, yeah, Rain should have been the one to potentially break the streak because then it's almost like that part passing of the torch. And for all the the bad press that Roman gets, like at the end of the day, he's a good he is a good wrestler. He can put on really good matches. And I think we forget how old the Undertaker is. Like he gets wheeled out once, twice a year, sort of thing. So he needs someone that can can lead the match. And at the moment, in, especially in the in the kind of raw roster, Reigns is one of the top guys to do that. So why not let him have his his spot? Why not have him let him have his moment in the in the limelight? Like I I get why so many people boo him um, because they're they're shaping him up to be another John Cena. Um, but I'm I'm kind of looking forward to this. I'm kind of looking forward to seeing how they develop the actual match, whether it is just going to be Reigns guiding guiding a, essentially an old man through a match, or if if Taker actually kind of 
beats him down and then Reigns has to rally round, which that's the kind of way that I'd like to see it. The thing that I have an issue with is the the build for this match. I think Fastlane being in the middle of, of Royal Rumble and now dampened this because obviously we saw Reigns eliminate Taker at Rumble. That's when this feud should have built because you had everything there. You could have had Taker playing the mind tricks with Reigns for a good two, three months leading into Mania rather than being it rushed quickly within a three week program. Um I liked the touch that they did on Raw when obviously Taker appeared in the ring. But with Taker you need to have these moments of where he's getting inside the mo the mind of his opponent and for me he hasn't really they haven't really done that at all because obviously we saw that Reigns obviously ended up spearing Taker and was the one that was standing tall at the end of Raw um, which I totally understand because it makes Reigns look strong but if you're going to do it as a if this is going to be a, a passing of the torch kind of match, you need to book take a really strong beforehand and I don't think they've done that unfortunately which is I think this is why a lot of people have a problem with this match. But over, overall, I'm it's one of the matches I'm kind of looking forward to mostly because I'm I'm more intrigued that, than anything just to see because I, I I think Reigns is going to win, but I can't like obviously well, we can't guarantee anything. But he, it's what this is one of the ones where I think there's more grey areas that that who's going to win. So it's one of the ones I'm more looking forward to on the card. Uh yeah um I I have to say problem I have with Roman Reigns leading this match is that I still think he's quite green. I still think that he's um uh, he needs the experience. He doesn't quite have well, like like the knowledge of the business like someone like for example say AJ Styles or Daniel Bryan would. They'd be able to lead Undertaker through a match. I think it's got to be up to Undertaker to actually lead Roman Reigns through, and dude's an old man by this point, so yeah, um, yeah, so there's that. I mean, two years ago, two years ago when uh like the Shield was still a thing. And and, and uh, people were wondering who's going to take Undertaker's torch. Like, I had two, like, names in mind. One of them, obviously, was Bray Wyatt because of the similarities between him and Undertaker and how thoroughly they commit to their gimmick. But the other guy was the guy on the roster who I thought was, oh, okay, this guy is as big as The Undertaker and has that sort of, like, cat-like agility that The Undertaker had. And that guy was Roman Reigns. But then after that, after Roman Reigns had to go on his own, and whether this is down to booking, whether this is down to how creative wanted him to look, he, he had a very limited moveset, and all of his matches looked kind of the same, which is why people uh, uh, went down on him. But yeah, no, I, I thought that Undertaker giving it to Roman Reigns might have been a really cool and good idea. But like I said, that was two years ago, and he's kind of been exposed since then. And they're shoving him down our throats. Now, the thing is, the people who are booing him are hardcore fans. And hardcore fans love Undertaker like they love no other uh, wrestler on this planet. So I think maybe WWE should be smart about this and have Undertaker win and win in decisive fashion. Because anyone who knows that Roman Reigns is essentially doing a job for him are the people who are the smart marks who are booing him every single week. And him doing a job to The Undertaker might just endear him enough to them to the point where they quieten down during his matches. Maybe not cheer him, but not as loudly boo. I don't know, that was... I mean, yeah, that's basically all I've really got to say on the matter. Um, quite an interesting sort of point of view, really, because I've, I've never kind of thought of it in that way, that, as you say, it is the hardcore fans that are the ones that are booing Reigns, and to, to it'll almost kind of gain the fans respect that he has put over this massive legend to to the extent that yeah that they might have as you say not cheer him but like we've seen it with Cena like obviously Cena still gets his his critics and everything but the matches that he's had with AJ recently have definitely turned a lot of people on to be like okay like we get Cena is actually an incredible talent and it could have the same effect if if Undertaker was to win against Reigns that could have the same effect on him. The one thing I'll jump in though is WWE will look at any type of reaction, which we've all, most of us all know is fact is any reaction is in WWE mind is money. People will buy money or buy tickets to boo Roman Reigns. The biggest, um, well, the biggest enemy of any wrestler in my mind is silence. 
Yeah. I mean, after they missed it, the thing that we always used to like, I remember I was one of those fans that booed Cena during that 2006 thing, and I loved it when I watched Cena get booed at the one night like, stand versus Rob Van Dam. And it's the type of thing that a lot of diehard fans are doing the same now. They'll buy tickets now just to boo uh, Roman Reigns. And same as we, it's the exact same thing. And the moment where a fact is like, whether it turns to his, well, turns in favor of him, where a fact diehard fans from. But I think we can all agree that WrestleMania isn't for the diehard fans regardless. I mean, we'll know this from the next match we'll probably talk about in a minute, in a minute is that WrestleMania is for all, every fans out there. It's not just for the diehards. It's for every type of fan out there. It's for the fan people that don't normally watch wrestling. Is that, you know what, as long as they're getting a reaction, especially for Reigns, whether it's booing or cheering, they'll, oh, they'll basically do what they've done in the past. Is that, You know what, when we watch it on the W Network or we watch it on YouTube, they'll dub the... They'll dub the the booze, and mm. they'll change it to faces of, hey, that guy was actually booing, was actually cheating when, you know, Reigns was getting beaten. Hold on, now he's crying. What's going on? Oh, that was it from two minutes. That was it from two minutes ago when he was actually, this was happening. And the, what, what happens? As long as there's not silence in that match, WWE will be happy no matter what happens. And you know what? It'd be great. Uh, you know what? It'd be great to see in a future where fans start to realize that, you know what, Romans can go. It would be great to see that. Because, let's face it, during the Shield days, he was that guy who basically was in the Survivor Series. He wiped out, I think it was four of the five guys in his opposing team. He was the guy that basically beat Kane's record in the Royal Rumble. And you know what? He's still that same guy. It's just sadly, as I think you said, Lee, is that he's been booked to look like this guy who he's not. He's a badass Samoan, as Paul Heyman once said, a badass Samoan with a chip in his shoulder. Yeah. And we've got this guy who's coming up with cliche words that John Cena would say and that's not who he is no. have him destroy things have him just going absolutely going absolutely ape shit on people just going absolute ballistics that's who he is that's what the fans want just why I see that happening I mean almost getting energy I'm almost now actually intrigued in this match just talking to you guys about it I was a whole lot more hyped now than I was before <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> yeah. well the, the problem with that though Craig is that if he goes around like destroying things and acting like the badass that he should be acting like then the mummies and the daddies won't buy the lunch boxes with his face on them for little Timmy and Tara so yeah that's some um <laughs> I, I mean but the thing is uh, I just want to uh, go to the fact that WWE has like the fact that WrestleMania is for quote unquote everybody is actually becoming one of WrestleMania's biggest problems because the way they make it, the way they publicize this event is by the way they get the casual fans interested is by making it the most important event of the year, like the big one, the most prestigious event you can possibly have. But then if you're going to do that, then us hardcore fans are going to say, well, if it is the most prestigious event and this is the biggest card then the best wrestlers, the one that we think are the best, should get it. And that disconnect between what we want and what WWE think the casual fans are going to buy is always going to be different. So, like, that is, unfortunately, I think, almost like a curse that WWE is going to need to be very, very, very clever with in order to, like, escape booing hardcore fans. I think that's going to be a real, like, that's going to be a real tricky hurdle for them in the next two or three years to try and overcome. If they still continue with this whole thing of, like, oh, we don't quite trust the AJ Styles, the Samoa Joes, the Kevin Owens to headline WrestleMania by themselves. Mm. Um, okay, uh, sorry? I was going to just quickly jump in there. In fact, is, like, is that not probably the reason why we've now got, you know, WWN and everyone jumping across to that experience? We'll discuss that in another podcast, perhaps. But the fact is, like, how now everyone's heading out to Orlando, like every other indie promotion in their own planet is heading to Orlando to basically be almost like this alternative to WrestleMania where everyone's now got this difference of basically, like, case in point, progress. Everyone, even though they're part of the fan access across on uh, WWE, you've now got multiple different promotions in America are heading to Orlando to basically be as, almost as this alternative to, um, to WWE, which we probably might see more in the future, but is I was just thinking, is that more or less like probably as we're saying, is a downside the benefit and is if also the WrestleMania 33's downside is also the reason why we're now getting this mass mass inclusion of other promotions at that in Orlando this year. I'm thinking just as yeah. one, just food for thought, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I'd feel a lot better about that the second I have more money to actually go over to America and participate in all of those events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Um, uh, yeah, so we're, so we're getting into the final two here. Um, right, I'm going to... Wikipedia has listed this a little bit differently, but I'm going to go first. I'm going to say Bray Wyatt, 
versus Randy Orton. And I'm going to take the lead on this one, actually, because I am one of the biggest Bray Wyatt marks you will ever meet in your life. I absolutely love the guy. And I actually think that this... I know a lot of people, like, saying, well, Bray Wyatt versus Randy Orton. Like, why, why on earth have they done that? And especially, why, why has Randy Orton uh, won the Royal Rumble? And I think that their booking of this is close to genius, because... Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton are actually incredibly similar in their personas, in the fact that they have what, what I like to call physical charisma, where every single gesture they make, every single step that they take, every movement of their body perfectly communicates their character to the audience. And I think that that is, like, them putting them together is essentially somebody in WWE saying, these guys have got a hell of a lot of chemistry together. That is so strong. That is so powerful. We actually need to put this in a main event at WrestleMania. Because I think that that is going to be a match for the ages. And I personally think, maybe I'm overhyping this. Maybe I'm basing this on a baseless notion. But I think this is going to be something special. And I think this is going to be the match of the night. And possibly the thing that everybody talks about for ages and ages to come. I think this is going to be really good. Uh, Tim? I totally agree with you i think that i absolutely love bray wyatt i think he's i've been wanting him to have the the title for ages and i'm so glad he finally has it um uh, admittedly when when randy won the royal rumble i didn't really get where they were going but it, obviously long-term payoff has just been brilliant like the whole kind of storyline between them two has been told really well um randy's one of those guys that i think even though he's always kind of been in the main event picture is quite underrated like as, as you said lee every, everything he does is done for a reason massively underrated yeah yeah like and i think that's kind of, this is kind of why they've placed this match so highly is that obviously wwe love orton like they've they've always put him in a in a high spot but they've never kind of for in my opinion they've never kind of given him that that opportunity to just kind of show what he can do like he's always been either part of a faction or he's been like underhanded. They've never kind of let him just be Randy Orton. And I think the same with Bray Wyatt. Like he's always been this character of Bray Wyatt. So now they've given him the belt. Okay, we've had the whole Sister Abigail kind of story in tow with it, but we've started to see Bray can actually wrestle. He's not just a gimmick. And putting these two together, <clears throat> We're going to see psychological battles. We're going to see physical battles. We're going to see great storytelling throughout the match. Um, they have it all. Yeah, they absolutely yeah. have it all. And I've said I've spoken um, to to friends of mine and on uh, a podcast that I do personally. We've spoke about my love for Bray Wyatt, and I personally want him to to hold the belt for a very long time. Uh, just kind of being this the creepy guy that always gets the win. Mm. Um, and I think this is the perfect ground to set that in motion. Even if we see, uh, not not maybe an interference, but just a point where the lights go out, Randy's about to hit the RKO, lights go out, and then Bray's just somewhere else. Like, mm. Something like that, a moment like that, that, as you say, that will get everyone talking, and it will set Bray as this new character that will be skyrocketed, but it also doesn't damage Randy. And yeah, I, I, as I say, I've, I've kind of hyped this match up more than I think most people have. But yeah, one of the matches mm. I think is going to be incredible on this card. And I think that's actually the reason why it's going to be so memorable is because of the fact that it's going to be such a big surprise to everybody. Nobody's going to see this coming, I think. Randy Orton, probably the most underrated performer for, for a good long time. WWE never had the confidence in his personal charisma to, like, let him go on his own, which is mm. frankly an attitude I think they should take towards Roman Reigns, why they suddenly feel that they can take a guy with an absolute lack of charisma, put him on his own now is, is, is kind of uh, uh, baffling. But yeah, like, people forget how Randy Orton's been booked. Like, people tend to remember Randy Orton as this, like, incredibly booked guy who got, like, the championship when he was the youngest guy and he went on to have like this huge period of dominance he really didn't he no. really did not ever have like he was constantly being i think triple h actually has been like the biggest thorn in his side uh match wise obviously in the back it's him and his attitude and the way he treats his uh his colleagues and things like that which means that when it comes down to it 
Triple H is the one who comes, uh, has to come down to the ring, have a feud with him, and basically put him in his place to yeah. calm his ego down a little bit. But yeah, like I'm a, yeah, but just basing it purely on in ring skill, he he should have been treated a lot better by WWE. Anyway, sorry, Craig. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, mate. Do you have any uh, thoughts on this yeah. match? <laughs> yeah, I'll be blunt on. Oh, have I got thoughts in this match, man? Um, yeah, I'll be blunt on. I mean, this the storyline itself. It's what Daniel Bryan and the Wyatt family should have happened a few years ago, when Daniel Bryan was kidnapped or whatever it was happened and been inducted into being part of the Wyatt family. Then that story kind of dissolved. This is exactly what should have happened then, and we're getting it now. And it's you know what it's. As we said, played to perfection. He has destroyed the Wyatt family. This was the biggest, this was the strongest faction who defeated the Shield. Regardless of being, you know, Bray Wyatt itself being defeated by the Undertaker, the faction was well known, established, and Orton destroyed it from within. And it's so good to see the beginnings of it and the end of it. Well, whatever's happening to it, this culminating in this match. I love this idea this match has happened because right now in the big in the onset of this match right in the beginning of it we've now started to see luke harper as an actual great wrestler that we know he is he's had great matches all because of all because it's spun off from this and i'm loving the idea of now we've got them well either main event or a second match and we've now got orton who now finally has a story he could pardon the pun sink his teeth into it is so good because Orton sometimes think, you know what, we love this stuff. He is an incredible worker. But you can tell when you see him, if he's been given a crap storyline, his heart isn't as much as he wants it to be. But right now, he has had a great storyline developing where he can just go out, be himself, and just go nuts. And it's great to see. And this is something I would like to go on from what Tim was saying. I would love the lights to go out. But you know what? I would love it to be Sister Abigail that stands there in the middle. I would love her to be standing at an entranceway or somewhere because you know what? He basically, as we said, Sister Abigail has been all over this storyline, not in person, but by by words, language, figuratively, all over. I would love to see the debut of Hope. I'm hoping it would be Mary Dobson or someone along the lines getting oh, okay, yeah. just to be mm. that. Just as basically just as a and mm. just like the lights going out, the whole entire place is filmed uh, with well, the lights of lanterns type thing. The spotlight and Sister Abigail, Orton turn around because he is the one that bun basically basically ruined her basically her place her thing, mm. um the sacred he ground. desecrated her grave that, yeah exactly mm. and then that's at that point in time where or where Bray strikes takes the title and in the ring stands Sister Abigail with even uh, with um Bray Wyatt and maybe even look Har- um, not look Harper the other one was the other one. Who's Eric Owen? Eric Owen. Eric Owen, yeah, who has been casting we- basically bizarre Twitter um, pictures across, which I would love to see just either three of them just reunite the brand new Wyatt family heading into SmackDown after this, using the carcass of Randy Orton as their template to use it. And it'd be just so good to see. And it's exactly something which SmackDown deserves to have, exactly the end of something that Bray Wyatt has going into SummerSlam or anything else. And Orton has shown exactly in the last few months, well, especially the last few months, for about six, seven months, exactly, not just as a keeper on the ring, but he's good at telling a story, they're actually communicating it as well, and actually showing the emotions that should be done as well. Awesome, cool. Um, uh, Yeah, <laughs> do you know what? I would love to leave it there, because that's such a positive <laughs> note to end on. I think but I'm, uh, it's such it a positive yeah. note. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, there is another match that we... I suppose we have to discuss this. Um, Goldberg Bro- versus Brock Lesnar. Who wants this? I'd, I'd, uh, let's say, Tim, go for it. <laughs> Brock Lesnar's winning. That's it. Is that all you have to say? <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> Brock has to win. Because I, why? Why? What is the point in doing this match otherwise? Because we've seen Goldberg squash two matches and te- well technically three if you're going to throw it throw in the Royal Rumble as well. I'd like to see this last longer than two minutes but th- for the only reason just to see Brock suplex Goldberg about a million times Never happen. It his, won't. <laughs> his, his, his shoulders are too messed up his neck is too messed up it'll never 
Like, like, like it'll be, it'll be short this one again. It'll be short because it has to be because Goldberg cannot go. He cannot go. Let him have his dreams, man. Let, <laughs> let him have his dreams, okay? <laughs> Just let him have this one, all right? <laughs> but no, I, th- I think rather than a spear and a jackhammer, we're going to see maybe one suplex and an F5. Lesnar gets the title, and that'll be that'll be it. I think there's not really a whole lot more you can say about it, to be honest. I just, I just want the crowd to boo Goldberg just once, just once, because they boo other people for so much less than the bullshit he gets away with, and I just like, I've never liked Goldberg ever, not even when it was uh, WCW. I've always thought the whole like, oh, this guy beats absolutely everybody thing is is the most boring way to book somebody on the entire planet. It's the reason why I was never really into Hulk Hogan. I was never really into a. Uh, the Rock or Stone Cold back then. My uh, my uh, wrestlers of choice were more guys like uh, Mick Foley and and guys like that. But yeah, just <sighs> no. I, I have no investment in Goldberg. I used to think Brock Lesnar was one of the greatest wrestlers I had ever seen, but that was back in two thousand and two. Now, like a, a long time ago, and those yeah. heyday days have gone. Like you know, the whole Suplex City thing was fine for two matches. But now it's all he does, and I wish he would do a lot more than what he actually like is asked to do in the ring. And yeah, just be the Brock of old, go against somebody else. God, if this is another two match, if this is another two minute match, I want boos to descend upon Orlando. I want them to be able to hear it in the Everglades, man. I just yeah, like <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't care. Like this match to me, if they do put it on last. This is bedtime. This means I get to go to bed at a much more reasonable time than I would do usually, which is about two minutes before than I would have done <laughs> if I had stayed until the end. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Craig. Right, okay. I'm going to say that I'm going to play devil's advocate. This should be, that, see the story leading into this. It should have its excitement, right? WrestleMania 10, 2004. I'm reading this directly off Wikipedia. Goldberg defeated Brock Lesnar in their first match against each other. Both left the company after the event, right? That should be that. You know what? With that, that they don't even have to write anything. That should be it, right? Done. And they come back at WrestleMania 33 to make their big mark after having, you know, Brock Lesnar being humiliated and under whatever God knows what was it, what two minutes or something like that. Should have been done, and you know what? We should be hyped up for it, but do you know why we're not? Because you know what? They've not been in the ring, they've not done any booking for it, they've done practically less work than you know. I, I came in that I've less work than I have to create a metaphor for that sentence. <laughs> that is how much and that's the reason why people are no invested in it. I mean, if you have Brock Lesnar, who 90 percent, 95 percent of his matches is him suplexing someone, and Goldberg. And um, basically, ninety nine percent of his matches, him basically spearing, jackhammering, whatever the rest is him just going. I'm going to stick my tongue out and then they headboard, maybe headbutt some sort of something in the background. I don't know, but if they'd done something to get us mostly interested, Paul Heyman is actually the one who's done more work than both these guys put together to get oh, people yes. interested in this match. Mm-hmm. After the Paul Heyman promo on that, I was almost interested, almost. And the thing is, that's pretty damn high because Paul Heyman is one of my heroes. I don't really dispute that one bit. But the fact is that even he couldn't get me hyped for this match because we've seen it so many times. And the thing is, I would love to see the chorus of booze like you're saying because you know what? WrestleMania 10, the weirdness and awkwardness of that was just not enough for me. I would love to see it again at WrestleMania 33. Fuck it. Throw Austin back in there. Get him the special guest referee. That'll get me interested again. And you know what? If it goes longer than one minute, I'll be surprised. If it goes longer than two, fuck fuck knows. But you know what? I cannot get invested in this. And I swear to God, going by social media, no one else can either. It is a match that's just there for publicity headlines. It's there for social, well, media of other companies going, hey, guess what? This other guy who used to be this is going to be doing this. There's no one that's really... If there's people interested in it, good on you. Get interested in it because you know what? Two minutes later, you won't be. But you know what? (laughs) It's just I cannot really get involved into this match because you know what? It's just what it is. Give Brock the title. Goldberg got his... Hey, he's now held a title. That's great. But you know what? It's... I cannot. 
get involved into it. You know what? I'm just literally, if, as Lee said, you know what? If it's basically the last match on the card, hey, guess what? I'm switching the match. I'm switching the thing off before the match because you know what? I have literally no interest in it. It's stuff like that that will put diehard fans off. It's, that pitch, it's You know what? It's matches like that that basically have people going to a WWN um, experience. That's what it is. And you know what? I know why they're doing it. As I said, it's mainly to the fact is to bring every fan into it because it's fans that remember Goldberg and WCW. It's fans that remember Goldberg in 2003, 2004, going, oh my God, it's going to be great. It's fans that remember 2000, the basic WrestleMania 10, uh, 20, sitting there going, oh my God, these two fought each other. It's going to be great again. No, it's not, guys. As we saw Survivor Series. If it didn't happen at Survivor Series, you know what? See, if it didn't happen at Survivor Series and it was built for WrestleMania, we would be more hyped for this, definitely. Because yeah. you know what? At least that we would be more disappointed that that one minute, 26 seconds happens at WrestleMania. Yeah. But you know what? I can't get into it because it's just such a disappointment. Actually, yeah. you know what? I've spoke longer than the predicted match is going to last. That's <laughs> yes. what I'm saying. So can't, that, there we go. That's my thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, like that, that that's the problem with this match is that we know it's not going to be a long one. We, we think that maybe it's even going to be a squash, like just to get Goldberg back, just so um, Brock Lesnar can retain a little bit of his reputation. But that's, yeah, like that's the thing. They shouldn't have done that in the first place. They should not have squashed the guy who had squashed everybody else on the roster. Because now, frankly, everyone else looks kind of ridiculous and... Either Goldberg or Brock Lesnar has to have the belt because they have clearly proven themselves in kayfabe through booking that they are the only people who, who can have their hands held, uh, raised, their hands held high enough and, and raised by the referee to say that, yeah, I am the best wrestler in this company because that's how they've been booked. Anybody else has it, according to WWE's booking, kind of a joke, really. So, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's my take on it. So anyway, oh, guys, right? Hi, hi. <laughs> um, cool, yeah. Um, uh, so, guys, right? Okay, uh, Tim, why don't you plug everything else that you do? And uh, yeah, well, why don't you tell us where we can find you? Um, so you can find me on Twitter at tim underscore burkbeck, which is b i r k b e c k. Um, I write obviously for the Steel Chair Magazine and Vault Channel Magazine, so follow their Twitters, mm -hmm. which. I should know off the top of my head, but I don't. <laughs> um, I also run my own little podcast, which is wrestling-based slash music-based, which is called Just an Insight. So uh, you can find that on Twitter as well, which is just underscore and underscore insight. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much everything I want to plug. Cool. Uh, Craig, our, uh, our dear editor, uh, where can we find you? Where can we see your stuff? On Twitter, you can find me at Craig Hermit. Um, basically, you'll find most of the stuff I am part of in t uh, involved heavily in Steel Chair Wrestling Magazine, which you can find it in Steel Chair Mag, or Voucher Hound, which is Voucher Hound, uh, Voucher Hound Mag again. Uh, oh, Voucher Hound UK, that's the one on Twitter. So basically, yeah, that's mainly everything you can find myself at. Uh, basically, that's that's the one. That's the one in the magazine. Oh, you should have a new magazine out yep. very soon, <clears> coming <throat> out in the next <throat> month with a lot more stuff in it. The current match is still in production at the moment with interviews from Rockstar, Spud, and a whole lot more with Eddie Edwards as well. And you know what? Coming next issue, certainly have a look. We'll be heavily publicizing that and a whole lot of advertising it all the way with a lot more stuff involved. Check out the Twitter. Check out the Facebook. Mm, certainly yeah. a lot of great writers put a lot of great stuff into mm. it. It's now available. It will, will be available in print and digital download in all formats. And the amount of stuff they've put into this month, basically, it's not crazy. Out of the park. Yeah, mm. it's, exactly. it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like oh, also, I mean, we've literally just uh, released uh, a few days ago uh, the latest issue of Vulture Hound. We've got a interview with Norman Reedus of The Walking Dead. Uh, he plays Daryl. Uh, if you know The Walking Dead, you obviously know that he plays Daryl in because he's the most popular character on God's Green Earth at this point, I think. Uh, my Facebook page is just plastered, inundated with uh, pictures of this guy's face. So yeah, we made him uh, the front uh, the front cover star of uh, this month's Vulture Hound. So yeah, uh, please check that out, guys. So anyway, there you have it, folks. That was the Steel Chair Shoot, and thank you for listening to all of our ramblings. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment if you agree or if you disagree. Uh, check out the MAGA issue.com slash steel chair that's iss 
uu.com slash steelchair where you can find all of our back issues and you can catch us on Twitter at steelchairmag and you can find me at fightlikeacow. Thank you all and I'll see you guys next time.